Good day, Judy. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Well, thank you for inviting me, Guy. It's a real pleasure. Well, you're most welcome. For our audience, I just wanted to establish the fact that you and I kind of go way back. Uh, I met you when I moved from Saginaw, Michigan to Chicagoland, uh, the western suburbs of Chicago, and I joined the uh, chapter of NSPI at the time, which is now ISPI Chicago. Um, but we met back then, and I remember seeing you present and, and, and talking with you at chapter meetings and things like that. So you and I kind of have a long history and an even more interaction at the international level or the national level of NSPI and then ISPI. Um, so we did one of these videos a long time ago, about a decade ago. And uh, so I thought it was time to revisit you. And I've changed this video series a little bit. So now I'm, I'm really looking for the journey that, that people like you have had as maybe to inspire others that are newer to the field in terms of, you know, what does it take to get to this kind of a, a position, this, this, this kind of a, a renown, if you will. And I, I say that because you're one of the most popular speakers in the society. And I remember when, when the Charlotte chapter, when we started in 2009, we had you as one of our first speakers to come because you're always a big draw. So again, thank you for doing this video with me. And let me shift gears here into my questions. For okay. audience, would you please introduce yourself and tell us, you know, where did you grow up? Well, okay, well, I am Judy Hale. And by the way, Hale is both, uh, is my maiden name. And ironically, my mother's maiden name was also Hale. So I'm a Hale Hale. Uh, <clears throat> my uh, mother was an H-A-I-L and my, she married an H-A-L-E. And uh, they, mom and dad did figure out at some time they were like seventh or ninth cousins some way, 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 way back or something like that. Well, anyway, but uh, in my early years, I grew up in uh, the uh, southwestern part of Ohio near the Indiana border. You know it as Middletown, Morrill, St. Paris, Dayton, in that particular area. But in the fourth grade, my family moved to Alexandria, Virginia. And that's really where I lived until I was graduated from high school. So what, where did you go to college and what did you study? Well, as you might imagine, I went back to Ohio. Uh, I went to Miami of Ohio, which is located in Oxford and where I was a, a, in the School of Communication. And I went there for two years and then I transferred to Ohio State, the big campus in Columbus. And that's where I got my baccalaureate degree. But uh, Miami offered me a graduate full cover, fully covered uh, master's. So I went back to Miami where I got my uh, master's degree, but now my major shifted to theater management. Okay, now I'm taking this journey a little bit further. Um, I was offered uh, an opportunity to get my doctorate, but starvation, I've, I've done that. I didn't want to do that anymore. So uh, the City Colleges of Chicago offered me a position and it was a very decent salary. So I moved to Chicago, which is where I am now. And I uh, taught, I was the infamous speech teacher. Okay. And I <clears throat> taught there for seven years. I was tenured. And uh, that's part of my other story about how I got to HPT. But is that enough about where I grew up? And Well, bit? no, that, yeah, that's very interesting. So so what I wanted to kind of cover is, you know, so what are you doing now? And then how did you get there? What is the job progression that got you to, you know, you're a consultant now, but uh, you know, tell us a little bit about the, your consultancy, um, what kinds of clients you serve, what kinds of services and uh, you render to the marketplace. But then, you know, what was the career progression, you know, after uh, going to Chicago and starting there? Why don't I start a little bit on the progression, the, the journey, <clears throat> and you'll All see right. how the pieces and the signposts come together in terms of where I am today. But <clears throat> I, again, was tenured, but I was bored. And uh, so I quit. And I uh, went to work for a professional association in real estate. And that's where I learned a lot about adult continuing ed and how that role is and what have you. But again, they loved me and I was bored. 
So I wrote a letter to seven companies in Chicago, a one page letter, same letter to all seven of them and said, I have an idea. And five of them called me up and said, let's talk. And that was the beginning of Hale Associates. Okay. I literally walked out the door with five contracts. So, so what happened and how did that, how did I get there? Well, first of all, <clears throat> when I was teaching speech, something happened that I hadn't realized what a blessing it was, Guy. I had over that seven years, I heard at least 500 people tell me their story. And they, they were working adults. Now you need to know this was the time of the Vietnam unrest, a lot of political unrest. It was also the beginning of adult continuing ed and there were labor strikes over who should be allowed to teach adults outside of the regular curriculum. It was a very tenuous, uh, volatile time. But in that hearings, people tell me their stories. I heard the workers view of the work, not the PR, not HR, you know, no, no, no. I heard the people tell me the story. Interestingly enough, at that time, nurses were being required to get their, become registered nurses. That meant that they had to have a four year degree. Well, they would go to the community college to take those core courses. So I had lots of nurses, I had lots of policemen because the police were being forced, pushed into getting a degree. So I, I got a, a window into the world of work that a lot of other people would have never been afforded. And I hadn't realized what an asset that was because when I went into consulting, I found I was able to step up real quickly. <clears throat> My learning curve in terms of the business was very fast. <clears throat> okay, so when I was with the association, that's where I was introduced to performance-based tests because that's what they did. And uh, I also started learning about management. So I started reading and studying. And then when I started my own company, one of my very first contracts was with the Insurance Institute. And I taught graduate level courses in management for 14 years, preparing people to sit for their exams. There's a uh, chartered, property casualty underwriter exams, life underwriter exams, and all that kind of stuff. So those early stages were building a, a foundation for me that I didn't realize it at the time, of course, but they were building me a, a very fascinating basis, which was one, what theater does. It doesn't matter how good it is, it's matter of that the audience accepts it. Does it work? Yes. Okay, right. when, you're, when you're dealing with listening to people tell their stories, it's about really what's going on behind the scenes. Not what, not what the press is saying, not, not what the PR or HR, no, no. How does it work really happen here? Okay, and, and so that kind of unfolded there. So during that time, I started studying value engineering and uh, I was also uh, joined the, um, labor relations organization. And these are where members uh, fought professionally. They were union organizers, union busters. But in this association, you were only allowed to join as an individual. You cannot join your organization. And they, I, my joke was that they would put their guns at the door and they would come in. But they were very respectful and they all had a common vision. And that was a safe, equitable work environment. So that laid some groundwork for me too. So even though they were enemies professionally, they actually had the same shared vision and working toward making that happen. So those were some real foundational pieces on my journey, if you will. And then it was in 1980 that I met what was then NSPI, ISPI. So, okay, so, so what do I do today? Well, you asked me about my elevator speech and if people stopped me and I would say, well, I consult with organizations, professional trade and corporations on how to build programs that measure the competency of their workforce. And that includes customers, suppliers, aftermarket partners, employees, all those people that help them do it. That's what I do. Now, go ahead. Do you want to ask me? No, 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 go, no, please go ahead. I, because I wanted to ask, I know that you've done a lot of work in the area of certification. 
And so, but I, I but I didn't want to necessarily just start and stop with that. I wanted to talk because I know you've done arbitration kinds of things. And so where does all that fit in? I want the whole story. Well, again, when I was with the labor relations group, I was called a neutral because I was neither a union member nor was I a union buster. Okay. And I, uh, so I went the arbitration route. Now this is contract, not labor arbitration, the contract arbitration. And I built very good relationships just with both parties, all, all the players. A fun story, um, I had a group out of South Africa contact me and ask if they, if I would be willing to host them. Well, I asked uh, a gentleman at, at, from the uh, Illinois Brotherhood of Electrical Workers to join me. And he met me in my office and these four gentlemen from Africa, South Africa, came to my office. And their first question was, what's the relationship with the AFL CIO and the CIA? Well, I thought the gentleman, the, the, my labor guy was about fall off his chair and he got up very graciously and he said, well, those are different. <laughs> but just think about, this was my understanding for the first time, how the rest of the world sees us. And then their next question was, why haven't you organized the nuns? I mean, okay, right. I mean, he was very gracious. It was a very interesting thing, but those were, that's when I realized the rest of the world doesn't see us as we see us. And that's become even truer over the years, but that was way back when, understanding what that was about. So yes, yeah, so that's where the arbitration came in, right. But when I moved in to really focusing on credentialing, I walked away from that. You can't, you can't be a neutral on Monday and not a neutral on Tuesday. I mean, it doesn't work that way. But that was a very valuable uh, developmental experience for me. So tell us a little bit about credentialing, uh, what I had called the uh, certifications, but the credentialing, I guess, is the more appropriate term. Well, what happened early in my business, okay? Uh, again, remember I'd work before I started my company for an association that had a performance-based certification. All right, so understand that. So then very early on, my work uh, in Hale Associates was predominantly um, doing more straight kind of consulting and things like that. Uh, one of my uh, earlier contracts was with the uh, Metropolitan Washington Airports Authority that you know it as Reagan or National and Dulles. <clears throat> and I worked with them for 10 years and I worked with them on, on uh, how to get their uh, very complex, uh, they had unions in this, they had uh, material handling systems, how to get that integrated and what have you, and things like that. And what is competence and all that kind of stuff. What I learned from that was how the, it, they brought to life that organizations are very complex, political, economic, social systems. That was real for me there. And I learned about the ultimate measure for an airport. Of course, planes come in, comes out safe. That's, we know that. But the real measure is their economic contributions to the community. So in that particular area, the CEO reported to the governor of West Virginia, Governor Maryland, Virginia, and the mayor of Washington, DC. And he reported every quarter his contributions to the economic growth of that larger community. Very opening for me. Now this is actually coming into credentialing, which is what separates me, okay, from my, my competitors. I also worked for McDonald's for close to 10 years, but on the supply side, uh, the quality assurance and supply, these are their, their supply chain. And again, McDonald's was building, glo was global before the word global was ever used. And how do you set up uh, and how do you work with in-country suppliers and services to provide a French fry that's the same everywhere in the world and all, all that kind of stuff. Again, I understood a real firsthand what a political, social, economic engine it is and how do you work with this, with these people. So one of the first assignments I had with him is that a senior executive came to me and he said, 
I don't understand. We have people with the same job title and some make three times more than the others. Why? I said, well, that's real clear. They're buyers. And um, if, if you're working with a supplier in, uh, well, we'll say uh, Peoria, Illinois, okay, that's established group in how to do it. But if you're working with a supplier in a, an emerging economy, the first discussion is what currency you're going to do business in. We don't even think about it. here it's going to be American dollars, right? But if you are working with somebody with an inflationary rate of 300%, what's the currency you're going to do business in? Mm -hmm. Secondly, they had to, McDonald's has health standards the rest of the world didn't have. So now you're talking, they were teaching them how to slaughter cattle. Here you're just buying it. There you're teaching them that. You, you were showing, you went in and said, no, you have screens on the windows. Maggots are not accepted, you know? So it, it was a very different world. And it became, gave me some real depth of insight that the world of work, even though we describe it in these job descriptions, in practice is very, very different. And we need to understand that. So how does that get me to credentialing? Well, real early on, I was hired to come in and help validate design, uh, set up certification programs, right? And that background uh, brought me with a bias and that was a bias. Did it matter? What's the, F, you know, what's the evidence? What you're asking people, you're measuring people in doing job. Well, have you looked at the context in which they're doing that work? Okay. They're not in pristine, equal environments. You have to look at the whole thing. So that is what really distinguishes today my work. So when I say to you that I'm hired to build programs to measure the competence, my programs are known for being evidence or performance-based, that I do look at the larger picture in which the work is happening. I'm very innovative in my testing instruments and methodologies. So I don't go by the rule book. You've written your own rule book. I, yes, mm -hmm. but it's published. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you, you, have a, you have a number of books out that maybe we'll, we'll get to that later on. So, so I was involved uh, with the board of ISPI when you were charged with um, putting in a, the certification program for ISPI, which had been controversial probably since the day I joined the organization in 1980. I mean, it was a big fight, mostly the gurus who didn't want to be cut out of the picture. It's like musical chairs, you know, when the music stopped and we had one of these, you know, would they have a place to sit? Um, but uh, you navigated that really well. And, uh, but can you, can you talk to us a little bit about that particular effort um, and some of the things that you had to navigate in establishing um, the ISPI certification uh, program? Well, first of all, <clears throat> what we ended up with was not at all what I had originally envisioned. So mm -hmm. I went in thinking that we were going to be building a certification for people who do the instructional systems work. I really thought that was what it was going to be. And, and, but because of my background, I knew you had to bring in not just the people who do the work, you have to bring in the people who hire you. Mm -hmm. And that was where the breakthrough was. And they, they were the Canon Imagines, the Walgreens, you know, the, the AT&T, and the people who hire us. And they were the ones that took us down a new path. They said, we don't care if, if what you do, you better have an end in mind. You better, you better be very clear about it. Oh, you better partner and collaborate. You better work with the people internally. Oh, uh, you, you better really make sure that what it did mattered and it made a difference. Oh, so they, they didn't care what your solution was. <clears throat> they looked at these other factors and that's how we came out with focus on results, take a systemic view. You better understand, we, you, all, you come to us and say, we need more money. Everybody needs more money. I'm sorry, there ain't no more money, make it work. So, so they wanted people who, were, who could understand their political economic realities and work within their world. That's, we call that systemic view. And, and adding value. And the idea that you come in and do it to us, uh, 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 you have to work with our people inside. 
That's where we got the partnering and collaborating, right? And, and the original set of uh, solutions did focus mostly on learning solutions. But we've, over the years, I mean, we have a pharmacist that came in here. We have fire marshals, you know, and certainly my work is not in the learning side. My work is in the measurement and credentialing or certification side, right? And so, uh, and we have a new person that just got certified who is in um, artificial intelligence and um, machine learning, um, all that yeah. fancy new stuff, right? So, so some ways, the good news is the standards service a larger group. The bad news is uh, I feel like we accidentally disenfranchised our learning community. And I've, I've felt that, that I've raised that issue consistently that we need to somehow, the, I really disagree, you know, you know, training doesn't matter. I really disagree with that. Training definitely matters. And we know from our own research that if you improve a system, redesign work process, you have to train people in new processes. If you design, if you disrupt roles, relationships, and you have to train people in what they are. If you put new technology, and so training will always be there. And I would like for us not to talk about it as, a, um, as an afterthought or somehow lower in a status. It's critical and, and it has to be done well. So I, so I have personal conflicts over that, that I think that uh, ISPI is, um, it's gone a little bit too far and, and it's disenfranchised much of its base. Yeah, that was always the worry with some, you know, there was the push by, by some of the thought leaders, if you will, of the society that, uh, you know, wanted to move away from instruction. Uh, Joe Harless's famous quote that uh, when ISPI or NSPI changed the name to performance, uh, and instruction, and he would say, you know, that's the equivalent of the Department of Transportation and Bicycles. But uh, so there was a lot of people who had that kind of a negative view <laughs> of that. But but performance improvement is is can be all inclusive of many kinds of things. I remember asking people back in the late uh, '90s, you know, is Lean is Six Sigma part of human performance technology or whatever? You know, there that, there was another fight about you know what do we call this thing. Um, and, you know, some people would say yes, and some people would say no, and it was just really unclear as to what this is. And so I remember uh, an article that the late Gary Rumler wrote back in 1983 about, you know, how to define what it is we do, what the society is all about, instead of trying to write a few paragraphs to describe it, define it in terms of what he called technology domains. And that would give equal footing to people who are in the instructional systems design business and the other people who are in the process business or organizational yeah. development, motivation, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it can be a big tent. And, and I, that's what I liked about the certification is that it was kind of a big tent thing, but it's all in how you market it, how you talk about it, how you talk about you know, the means to that end of improving performance you know, and, and where is that limited? So, you know, it was a tough thing to tackle, but uh, but the, I think the certification did it well because it was all about not just pr proving that you had the awareness and knowledge or, you know, incremental skills. It meant that you had all of that to actually have an impact. Right. And talk right. to us a little bit about, about that aspect of it, that it's, that it's, not, a, it's not a knowledge certification. It's it's well be well beyond that. Well beyond that, it's it's the fact that you're able to work in these complex political economic systems, and you're able to work and collaborate with those people, and you're able to jointly come to some consensus on what you want to do, how you want to do it, how you want to approach it, and you facilitate conversations about did it matter, did it work, so did did did, did some change, whatever miracle we thought was going to happen, did it happen? And, um, and it was agnostic in how you went about it in the sense that you could have done it through training, but training was rarely by itself. And you could do process improvement, but that was rarely by itself, okay? So you were able to talk about what you did and your role in that process. So, that it, it, so that's really what makes it unique is the fact that it is what we call performance-based. 
Okay. Yes. So my, my next question related to th that particular effort was there was a partnership that was established with one of the uh, with the 800 pound gorilla in the field, so to speak, back then. I don't know how comfortable you are about speaking about that, but, but we partnered with ASTD initially. Can you share, talk a little bit about that? And then they- They, they, they did, okay. and they kept insisting they were not gonna do it, but they were in fact misleading. Now the people who were in the room with us, I don't know that they knew that their leadership was gonna be what they had planned. But they then came in and basically typed, tried to usurp the whole effort in, in what they were doing. And that was very disappointing, very disappointing because we were quite upfront with them and they actually posted on their website, did whatever. Right. But in the background, they had all along decided that they were going to go for their own and they were going to take our work and leverage it and make it go forward. Well, and they kind of narrowed it, if I recall correctly. It, it, I don't know if it was uh, immediate, but it basically kind of narrowed to more of an instructional bent. Yes, it did. And Do so, I have that correct? Oh, yeah. So they then focused around it, which was actually a market wise, smart market decision. And they, they went in so you could demonstrate you had to have a knowledge component. So they had a paper and pencil test. And by the way, that's where you make your money because people have to buy your books to study and they have to take your training. That's where the money is. And so they did that. And then for the performance piece, you got to choose what you wanted to do in, in the vast majority. And you had like, a, like three choices. And one of those was in fact a, a, a learning system outcome. And so they, they, they got that. Now they've gone back and further refined that even more because uh, <clears throat> they also built a system that uh, is labor intensive to, monitor, uh, to, to administer. But now with the new technologies, they can uh, it, it can be much more feasible to do. Yeah, but they've yeah. even changed the name on a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they're again so, focusing on they're focusing on talent development. Right. So that's that's part of the brand. And so they what did you do to? And that can be anywhere from screening, onboarding, to training, mm -hmm. and things like that. So that's that's where their focus is. So they they walked away from process improvement they you know they walked away from those things and they're really focused on what is true to their brand which is talent development yeah mm -hmm. and so but part of this is uh you mentioned the labor intensity of doing the evaluations of submissions in that because it's not as simple as as scoring a paper and pencil test um it it, it it takes more effort and so what so in your own work that you're doing now with your consulting clients, moving away from the, the narrow focus on what NSBI, ISBI did, or, or you did with them. So how, do most of your clients uh, embrace going beyond the kind of a knowledge test and in looking at the uh, broader system? And, and then how do you mechanize that? And how do you resource that uh, because that would be a huge issue, I, I think, uh, to overcome with a lot of clients in terms of if you really want to prove that somebody is capable of doing something, it's beyond a knowledge test. Correct. <clears throat> but the answer that you're asking is not really quite simple. But first of all, we have technology today that we didn't have before. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, my roofing clients, okay? Uh, we, there is such a shortage in the skilled trades so this is a true partnership, uh, build, um, material manufacturers, big distributors, larger contracts have come together. <clears throat> they have volunteered to create mock-ups to standard and uh, roofers can come in on that mock-up and demonstrate that they can do whatever that system is. Okay, it's an incredible job of collaboration. You've ever seen that. So the, so the economic, cost is very much shared and and many times a test is free okay so and the scoring is done by a trained facilitator who has been calibrated who the training to certify to certify the certifier the the, yeah. the reviewer uh their test is a whole bunch of little videotapes that are like three seconds 15 seconds 19 seconds 45 seconds and they're shown very specific things do they recognize the mistakes and the errors? Because they're going to go live and watch somebody and they can they can certify four people at a time. 
they have an automated scoring tool that comes in. So we've been able to leverage technology, whatever, but that's one. I'm sorry, you got to build a roof. So you, and the, the multiple choice test makes no sense at all to them. Uh, roofers, by the way, uh, good roofers earns like six figures. So understand that that's, that's a good job. But uh, our roofers here like have a literacy level at third grade. Have you tried writing a test at the third grade level recently? So, so tests, the classic multiple choice tests have so lack validity, they do not do anything there, right? So, and 50% and of them are non-English. They're either Polish or Spanish. So, you, so we have developed uh, through the ability through uh, translated audio and whatever, but they actually go to a site and, and they can, and there are 15 different systems. So you're not getting certified in roofing. You're getting certified in A, asphalt roofing. Yeah, We're getting yeah. ready to do metal roofing, clay and tile. You understand? Mm -hmm. So there's 15 of those. And, and by the way, we found out roofers only do one system. They don't do all these. They do one system. They do steep or low. They, they, so, so how do they do that? Well, that's an example like that. Now, Google is another one of my clients and currently. And uh, now let's just go. Google knows everything. So let's get real clear, okay. But Google, they are assessing people's ability to code, to, to do that. Now this is a totally performance test and they give problems out there and their tests are administered all over the world. <clears throat> and they have to code and they have the technological capability of scoring that coding right now to know whether or not the code works. Mm -hmm. So there's, so that's, that's an elegance in technology that many of us don't have the advantage of doing. But Sherm now, I mean, they're, they're testing 155, just heard last week, 155,000 people. Well, they use uh, artificial intelligence uh, to read and, you're, and you, now you're writing your answers, you're typing, you're sending in manuscripts and that's all a, a machine learning score. They can't, I mean, how do you do 155,000 people? Exactly. Yeah. But, so, so we have real innovations coming along, but we're also, uh, I'm trying very hard to get them to embed a lot of that, the testing, classic testing into the training mm -hmm. there and use those systems. So whether that means the instructor delivers it or if it's online, that it's, that you, you build the knowledge components, those enabling pieces, push them back where they really belong, okay? And then focus your final certification test on their ability to apply, solve problems. And we can now, uh, through virtual reality, SimCity, uh, augmented reality, we can now compress that. We can do compressed time. We can do uh, a life, uh, we, we can emulate in five hours, we can emulate uh, one year. So you can do something and you go get a cup of coffee and you find out, you know, two months later what happened, the consequences of your decisions and your actions. So that can all be very much automated, Guy. It's fascinating. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, it's the, our world has come a long way since uh, back, back in the day, I guess. Well, Absolutely. Let Absolutely. me shift gears here a little bit with you. Let's go back to, I want to explore uh, your first exposures to human performance technology. And I'm doing this for our audience. Now, who are some of the, the most early influences when you first became aware of this? Who are some of the people or the books or the articles that we might point our audience to that had an impact on you at the very beginning? early stages and it could be HPT specific kinds of things, but, but have influenced you in your, throughout your career. Well, let, let's very, it was Bob Mager. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. He's, he's done the best in terms of defining what are your objectives. I'm sorry. He's to me, he's still top, yeah. top of the heat. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but I was very interested to all of Bob Mager's work. 
And then Deming's work. Now I know he's quality, but he still is interested in feedback and measurement and what have you. One of our first uh, ISPRs was Glenn Valentine. Yeah. Glenn, Glenn's writing on feedback and feedback systems is one of the most elegant works I've ever read. Very, very fascinating kind of thing. Now, outside of ISPI was Boyitis. Now, Boyitis was a student of um, Mc, um, McClellan. The medium is the message. Yeah, and Boyitis, yes, and, and, and Boyitis did the, some of the original research to identify core competencies of effective managers. And it was his methodologies that I found very, very interesting in how he did that, okay? Then we have, uh, but also in 81 to like 91, 90 in that area, I was privileged to be a member of what was now, what now the International Board of Standards for Training, Performance, and Instruction was called the and, and But then when they started, they were a joint task force of, I, of NSPIs mm -hmm. and AECT. Mm -hmm. And the, both societies created a task force that worked together to develop standards and the standards were for instructional designers, okay? And mm -hmm. trainers. And I had the privilege, that's where I worked hand in hand with, with uh, Barry Bratton from yes. Iowa, mm -hmm. Barry Booth from Caterpillar. I had uh, Westgard, I had uh, Fauché and Silber who was Deltac and ASI. Then I saw Faye Stein who was later, I don't know who she was with then, but she later went with the um, uh, American Heart Society, okay? And then there was Bill Coscarelli, Sharon Schrock from, you know? Southern Illinois, yeah. So please, I mean, I got for 10 years, I met with him four times a year to do these issues on, on developing these standards. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was huge for me to work with those people. Yes, I think IPSTIPI is is an organization that uh, uh, people in our field should understand who they are, what they do. They have a, a series of, of uh, certificate uh, standards. That they standards. And you can read the for free the standard statements, and then there's other things that you can purchase that go deeper beyond uh, uh, what the free stuff is. But uh, it's a good resource for people. Um, I remember talking with Barry Bratton about all of this before those standards even came out in the uh, early to mid eighties. Cause I think those standards came out in the 86. I was just talking with people about it to be recently here. So, so, so you've, uh, you've just told us a little bit about those people and, uh, and, and some of the, the things that people might read and follow up on. Um, You've already given us your 30 second elevator speech, so I won't ask you to do that again. Um, but as a, so you're a lifelong learner, you're, you're still practicing your, so what is your current focus or near term focus and what you are trying to learn right now? So what's, 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 uh, where are you pursuing? Well, it, it, I'm still involved in the certification world. That's heavily, that's what pays the rent and if you will, mm -hmm. allows me to meet my mortgage and all that kind of stuff. But I am really looking at um, the you, growing use of technology. You call it artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, and how we can, and we have to be careful because uh, one of the research pieces we're dealing with is the bias that's inherent there. And so if you have a machine scoring you, you have to make sure that it hasn't, it's not, it's not being biased about whoever you are, okay? So and and uh, so that's really where my focus is, or something like that. I'm, I have right now. So I'm working with Google, as I mentioned, uh, the facility managers. I started with them in 1984. Guy, they're still a client. They're still a client, and so we are dealing with global issues. We're talking about uh, sustainability. We're talking about that. So with them. My work is less on the testing and more on defining competence. It's how do we validate what we're measuring and are we doing it right and things like that. That's, that's been a real pleasure. And I'm working with Gallo Wineries. Um, they are a privately held 
fully integrated, very socially responsible firm. And, and it's, it's, it's a joy and a challenge to work with somebody like this. I mean, they, they have their own sand mine. So they make their own glass and blow their own bottles. They have their own vineyards, right? So they take it from raw materials all the way to the end. And they have, uh, they want to make sure that their people are competent and how do we do those things and all the way down the stream. Uh, and for example, when I talk about social responsibility, they, which is relates by the way to my facility managers because I'm working with them on a whole new program about sustainability and social responsibility. I mean, for example, they've already have a team. What do we do when we exhaust a sand mine? What do we do with that asset? How do we repurpose it? How do we restore it? What do we do? They are the largest producer of natural food dyes. So when you're making all that, you're scrunching all those grapes, right? You got a lot of byproducts. And well, they, by the way, the seeds and skins and whatever, extremely nutritious cattle food. So they, they have, what we would see as waste to burden someone else. They convert that waste into an asset for someone else. It's a whole different mindset. And uh, so I'm bringing all of that to my uh, certification and how we design that. So are we ever thinking, are we just thinking about making the buck for the now? Or are we also looking about what are the impact? Are we burdening? Have we shifted the cost? So last year I did the symposium on the economics of ignorance. Because you you have here one of the questions you a quote you don't want to leave with someone and I and it's ironically um, it's the uh, Napoleon's quote and his point is uh, I'm paraphrasing but don't confuse don't think don't confuse malice with ignorance. So sometimes we think people are being evil and nasty, but they're actually dumb. <laughs> Don't know better. Unaware, ignorant, right. <laughs> so I, so this is a new area for me is to how we can bring greater awareness and how we can get people to understand, to not just think today, but think tomorrow mm -hmm. and be innovative and in how we don't burden the future. But how can we do that? So, and I'm using my certification work to help do that. Very cool. No, I, I've been I've been watching from afar since I moved away from the Chicagoland suburbs 20 years ago. Um, and uh, but uh, I'm all I I always love uh, hearing about your work and and reading about it, etc. Let me shift gears here. So you you almost hit on this here. My next question is uh, is about terminology and I'm asking is there a, a performance improvement term or a phrase that you would like to define for us perhaps you feel it's uh, being misused or misconstrued and you want to put your own spin on it but uh, you know we have a lot of uh, uh, terminology issues semantic issues in, the, in our field here uh, so don't limit yourself to one but uh, if you have more than one that you would like to to put your spin on but what what do you have for us well, I, I have always called myself a consultant, a management consultant. I never had HPT or anything else in my words. But today, I, I really think the, the work is about human and organizational effectiveness. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm going to go back to Harless, making sure we're doing worthy work. And we're doing it in a way that's both efficient, effective, and ethical. So I've added a 30 and we sometimes think effectiveness, I, we can be effective and unethical. So I, I, so those, so when people really push me around, say, you know, your certification, what differs you and things like that. I too talk about, I want to make sure people are doing worthy work, work that matters. And I want, and I, I'll say that they're doing it in a ways that are efficient, effective and ethical. So I'm calling it out. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It's, uh, yeah, ethics is a, is a huge issue. I mean, the world's proven it to be a huge issue, a huge challenge for just going for the short term. And I think that that links nicely with the uh, social responsibility or what the late Roger Kaufman called uh, 
uh, mega um, beyond the micro and macro to you know the social responsibility, social good. Um, let's hope that uh, more people uh, and organizations really embrace that. If I may, Guy, part of this is is, is understanding economics. We we um, real early in my work, real early in my work, I was, and I probably with the buyers at Sears I was working with. Um, the concept of you can avoid costs, you can reduce costs, you can shift costs. And sometimes we just shift the cost. We shift it to future generations. We shift it to other nations. Okay, we'll go in, we'll rob them of the resources and we'll leave them. And then we, then we wanna know why they can't earn a living and why they can't take care of themselves. But we've tainted their water, we've done this, whatever. So, the, the, so I really, um, real early on, uh, I mean, in the 70s, I was into shifting, reducing, avoiding, eliminating the whole thing. And the concept of shifting costs has stayed with me uh, all these years. And I think we need to be far more cognizant of that. Let's just talk about computers. They're wonderful, absolutely wonderful. But when they were originally designed, no one built into their design how to dispose of them. That was never on the formula. So now we have land waste. We have all of this stuff, right? Nor when we build things, do we consider the use of natural resources, okay? So, so our schools of management and all of that, they only bring you up to distribution channels, pricing, things like that, but no one builds into the formula, disposal, restoration of natural resources, none of that is in their formula. And we would have a different world today if the, it doesn't mean we wouldn't have computers, we would have computers, but we would have computers that in fact we would have a plan for how to properly repurpose their ingredients, their pieces, their parts, you know what I mean? But we wouldn't be just be dumping them right. somehow. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, to me, that is what human performance technology is all about. That is looking at that larger view. It is, so um, it's not just, uh, so I, I happen to think that's what I think distinguishes me and in, in, from my competitors. That's what served me well over the years, okay? Yeah, that's why you have long-term clients because yeah, it's your view is the long term, the full life cycle, not just a right, right, right version of it. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, well, I, so let me shift gears here again just a little bit, and this is kind of revisiting some of what we covered a little bit earlier. But I'm looking for any shout outs of people that uh, have had a major impact on you, and and also if there's a story behind that. Uh, uh, in our prior video, you told the story about Tom Gilbert, and he liked a particular uh, uh, type of soda pop, and you used yeah. that. <laughs> and and that, so I'm looking for those kinds of things. So, so who uh, in in the people that you work with, uh, others in the profession, other customers, or whatever, um, do you have any short uh, stories that, that you can tell that help? humanize some of these people and if it's somebody that the you know the audience isn't going to know but you'd like to do a shout out to them that's all fine but uh you've worked with a and 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 your network is quite broad and you you know a lot of people in the business so you know do you have two or three stories you can tell about some of these people well even though right now i'm pretty much a lone ranger even though i do have a new person who's working with me but for a long time, I had employees, like 11 employees or something. Right. But what, what's, a, okay, when I shut my business down, you need to know my mother was living with me and I simply could not do the marketing and sales to feed 12 people and care for my mother. Mm -hmm. So it took two and a half years and I, uh, I asked the people, I said, you want to help with business development or do you want me to find you a job? And they said, find me a job. Everyone wanted to work for somebody else. So it took two and a half years and all of them were found jobs that were taken care of, not a problem. 
And then I came home and I set my office up here. The first thing that hit me was how alone I was. I was not prepared for my feeling of abandonment, yet I had engineered the situation. So what I had to learn to do was build my whole support network again. Now, a lot of those were people I knew and something like that. So I cherish long-term friends. So we'll call the Ken Silvers, the Rob Fauchets, and um, they are my brain trust. They're the, they're the two, they're the most up-to-date in research. I don't have to do the research. I have to have a relationship with them, right? So I do those kinds of things. And then I have other people that are just really good for help, helping me stay grounded and keep sense. So I would say that we're, if you're gonna operate as a Lone Ranger, it's a lone world out there. And I would caution you from doing that. But instead, understand we build your own community and, and cherish those people and nurture those people okay and they will be there to support you over time okay that's that's how i would say but you asking me about particular other individuals and human kinds of stories i'm kind of like hmm where do i go <laughs> from here with that this is a slippery slope have, yeah you have to be careful i have learned from everyone even mm -hmm. if i've learned what not to do okay you learn so so I, I just cherish everyone in that way and, and how they can, you know, everyone is a gift, even if the gift is wisdom about what not to do. Yes. The examples and non-examples as we've learned to call them. Well, let me shift gears here to, to kind of beginning our wrap up here. Um, Again, thank you so much for agreeing to do this interview with me. And my final question, uh, you, you've kind of hit on a little bit about this, but the, uh, let's wrap with what guidance would you give to new people coming into the field um, in, in terms of you know what, what their expectations might be, how they need to uh, be, uh, conduct themselves? Uh, you, again, you've hit on a lot of these things here throughout the interview, but uh, so what would your parting words of wisdom be to, to the new people coming into the field? I, I would tell them to respect the views of everybody they're working with. They can disagree with them. They can see that the people are, in fact, working from an Ill, uninformed or ill-formed position, but they still need to respect it. So it's, it's in respecting people and where they come that they're... they're be more open to inviting us in and learning with us and from us. Okay, so I I really, um, you know, I'm a human being. Sometimes I just want to wring people's necks, okay? I'm no different than anybody else. I get very frustrated. But that doesn't solve the problem. That doesn't move us forward. And so we, we have to respect where people are. And, and in doing that, they're more likely to give up their point of view and be open to new information. But if we resist them or we somehow discount them, we only entrench them. <clears throat> they hold on to their ill-formed views even more ferociously. So we have to figure out innovative ways to let people let go. Okay, so I guess that's what I'm saying. I, I was talking to some, you know, young students who are getting their doctorates and they're so excited and proud. And they said, well, I told them what they have to do and how come they won't listen to me? Well, um, partially because you came in and discounted. I mean, when you have somebody who's been on a job for 20 years, why would you say you're stupid? I'm sorry. They've been doing their work. They, they've been rewarded for that work. You know, why don't you honor where they are, if you do that, then they'll be more open to say, well, maybe there's, maybe there is a better way. And I, I just, I think that's what I would, you know, I would also say, find out the people who get as close to the people who actually do the work, not the people who talk about it, not the people in HR who are gonna hire for it. No, no, 
you you want to get as close to the real work where it really happens and not you know and honor that very good advice judy again thanks so much for doing this interview with me today uh i hope to see you in the near future well hopefully come the latter part of this year travel will be possible how's that and but in the meantime we just deal with zoom exactly thank you so much have a great day well thank you very much guy i was an honor and a delight a delight to see you and an honor to be part of your program thank you bye-bye bye-bye